Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I wish to thank the Africa Research Institute for inviting me um, as a co-panelist along with uh, these lovely people. It is an honor. Um, I will be speaking today on the fragmentation of political cohesion in Nigeria and the capacity of the state to contain the Boko Haram insurgency. So in that respect, I'm approaching this from a slightly different perspective, from a more sort of institutional perspective, so to speak. Um, I'm a third year doctoral research student, and my research focuses on um, the political, well, it's a political economy analysis of um, Nigeria's efforts to diversify its economy. Essentially, I am looking at the interaction between political institutions, frameworks for distributing power, and economic policy. Okay. And, uh, and economic policy and how this interaction affects economic outcomes. Uh, so that's the reason for my institutional approach. And then secondly, um, I am also uh, an analyst. I write for local and international media on uh, politics, on development, on security in Nigeria and in Africa at large. So in that sense, just on Boko Haram itself, I followed it for, well, since 2011, so to speak. And then thirdly and most importantly, when you strip away all these layers and labels of being a researcher, an analyst, a writer, and so on, I am Nigerian. I am deeply concerned and frustrated by the level of violence, the uh, massacres, the spike in fatalities, and importantly, the deterioration of trust among communities that, uh, that lived hitherto in relative peace. Uh, so you, you will therefore forgive me if, I any, if at any point I get a bit emotional. Hopefully I won't. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll start with a very brief story. In late July this year, I, I was rounding up my doctoral fieldwork in Lagos, and I was preparing, and Lagos is in the south of Nigeria, just in case you don't know. Um, and I was preparing to head to Kaduna up north to my parents' house. Uh, I was planning to go there to spend the Eid festival, which was just a few days away, when my mother called me on the phone and said that I should postpone my trip because there were assassination attempts on a former head of state and a key opposition figurehead, General Muhammadu Buhari, and also uh, assassination attempts on uh, an Islamic cleric, Sheikh Daya Rabauchi, who is actually very influential, not just in Nigeria, but in the whole of West Africa. By, uh, and this assassination attempt was by suspected Boko Haram militants. So apparently what had happened was that suicide bombers attacked their convoys in central Kaduna within minutes of each other and narrowly missed them both. But coincidentally, the attack on the cleric himself took place just about two kilometers away from my house. And you have to understand that these two are very influential figures with huge grassroots following. If anything had happened to them, it would have sparked off an unprecedented wave of violence in the country. So when I eventually made it to Kaduna about two days later, I, I couldn't travel for two days because all flights were canceled. I mean, the prevailing mood in Kaduna and really in the northern part of Nigeria in general was that, and this was just the mood, I'm not saying it, it was an accurate reflection of reality, was that the ruling party had ordered a hit on both figures to spark a political crisis. While the prevailing mood, mostly in the South, but mostly by people affiliated to the ruling party, was that the opposition had staged these attacks to undermine both the ruling party and the president. But, you know, in between, or yeah, in between these two narratives, many people just conveniently forgot about the existence of a vengeful nihilist Islamist group known, known as Boko Haram, which had threatened to attack several political and religious leaders. <coughs> so I've, 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 got, I've gone the extra mile to start with this story because it sort of lays the 
uh, foundation or it gives you an insight into how such key events are interpreted by people or how the interpretation of these assassinations in particular, not just by different segments of the political class, but also by Nigerian society as a whole, reflects the absence of a cohesive national narrative on Boko Haram's origins, on its motivations, on its implications for the country's future as well. And this is my argument, that the absence of a cohesive narrative by the Nigerian government by the people and by communities affected by conflict, by violence stemming from this insurgency is a consequence of the deterioration of trust, the instrumentalization of fear by the political class and growing polarization within Nigerian society. Uh, for those of you who do not know this, uh, Nigeria has been battling violent extremism for the better part of five years but it was only a number of recent events, particularly the abduction of more than 270 girls from the remote community of Chibok in Borno in northeast Nigeria that focused the world's attention on this. Within this period, this, within these five years, the goals of Jamaatu Alu Sunnah Lidawati Wal Jihad, this is actually the real name of Boko Haram, but Boko Haram was given to it by the media. Uh, this, <laughs> this, uh, you know, their goals have evolved. They, they, they have moved from just being a hermetic, ascetic group, living life away from a society they deemed as corrupt and decadent, to now waging a vengeful war against all symbols of modernity, democratic governance, and Western education. And within this period as well, the violence and fatalities resulting from the insurgency <coughs> have ex escalated exponentially. I mean, just this year, January to August, more than 6,700 people were killed uh, in mass murders, in beheadings, in mysterious assassinations, mass abduction of women and children, forced conscriptions of young men, you name it. All these cases of mindless violence have consumed more than 6,700 lives. Although there have been some su successes by, by the, the military task force in, in recent offensives, there, there, there has been a persistent inability of the government to effectively contain this insurgency, but also in constructively engaging with Nigerian society over this. And the thing is, most Nigerians have struggled to understand and accept this upsurge in violence. Actually, when you speak to people, people are still in huge disbelief. So for instance, when something happens, there's a bomb attack or something like that, you find that a lot of people say to you, no, I don't think a Nigerian did this. You know, we Nigerians, we love life, we love our parties. How can we have suicide bombers? They must be foreigners from Niger or Cameroon or Chad. So there's still that, that <coughs> sense of disbelief. So people have struggled to come to terms with this. And because of that, competing narratives have emerged. These are at the governmental level between the federal government and the states. And again, for those of you who do not know, Nigeria is a federation, meaning that at the national level, there's a federal government, and at the sub-national level, there are 36 states with state governors. So there's this disparate narrative at the governmental level, and secondly, also at a partisan level between the ruling party and the opposition party, and thirdly, at a regional level between the North and the South. So within the government itself, and hope, I, I hope I'll have time to go through these three. Within the government itself, the narrative has been mostly incoherent and highly politicized. Both the federal government and the states, in the, in the Northeast in particular, and this is the stronghold, the epicenter of Boko Haram, they have been preoccupied with trading blame over who is more negligent or who is more corrupt and so on. So the issue here is that constitutionally, the responsibility for security lies with the federal government. 
So the federal government has a uh, mandate over uh, you know, the, the, the army, the police, the state security services, and all other um, security apparatuses. <laughs> but then again, since May 2003, the three northeastern states, which are really the epicenter of the Boko Haram insurgency, Borno, Adama, and Yobe, have been under a state of emergency, which is like a martial law. So it, it, this state of emergency gives even greater powers to the federal <coughs> government over their security. So these states, therefore, accuse the federal government of negligence, of incompetence and corruption, which is affecting the capacity of the military to address violence and to, to, to tackle uh, the, the, the Boko Haram militants. So there have been so many cases, and these are things that are really in the public domain. When you just Google them, they'll come up. You know, soldiers have abandoned the battle line, refusing to fight, complaining of sabotage by their commanders, complaining of having very poor equ and outdated equipment in comparison to the well-armed insurgents and things like that. And this is despite a defense budget, which is about 20% of the national budget, actually, uh, amounting to about $6 billion. <coughs> In turn, the federal government blames the states for exaggerating the insecurity in their domain to embarrass it because they are opposition states. So here it is also important to understand the reason behind this fragmentation at this level and uh, the, the lack of cohesion between the federal government and the northeastern states. And this lies in being able to understand the origin and nature of the current tension heating up the political environment in Nigeria. So the, the, the next round of elections are coming up in February 2015, and it is widely expected that the president will be seeking a second term against a groundswell of opposition from the, the, the main opposition party, the All Progressives Congress. Jonathan's emergence as presidential candidate in 2011 breached a power-sharing rule within the ruling party, the People's Democratic Party, in which presidential power was supposed to alternate every eight years between the mostly Muslim, uh, Muslim northern counterpart, uh, elites and their mostly Christian counterparts. And here again, let me just clarify something that Nigeria is not really divided uh, between a Muslim north and a Christian south. You know, there are significant numbers of uh, Christians in the north, so also significant numbers of Muslims in the south. But the thing is, when it comes to elite bargains, they, a lot of times they think that way. You find a lot of northern Muslim elites striking deals with Christian southern elites on that basis, you know, on, 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 on that sort of platform. So while this, this power sharing agreement was really an intra-party arrangement and it was not and it is still not included in the country's main constitution, it is important again to understand why it was so relevant to a lot of things. This, share, this power sharing mechanism negotiated among ruling elites was the major basis on which the country made the transition to democracy from military rule in 1999, hence its significance. So according to this arrangement, it was the turn of the Muslim North to produce a president in 2011. But then Jonathan's emergence breached this formula and created significant grievances in the PDP. And then a few aggrieved Northern PDP politicians who felt shortchanged of their turn at the presidency threatened to make the country ungovernable for Jonathan. Actually, someone said ungovernable, we will make this country ungovernable. But the thing here is that in Nigeria, and I assume in quite a number of uh, developing countries, you know, the heat of democratic politics, the politicians say all sorts of things, and then once, once they are settled or once they're able to negotiate and strike deals, all these threats become irrelevant. And this is usually the norm in Nigeria as well. But then what happened was that as these things were happening, they coincided with the escalation of the Boko Haram insurgency. 
and this was because the leader of the group had been killed in late 2009. A lot of the members went into hiding, so as the, the PDP was having its political spats and squabbles, Boko Haram was regrouping and coming up. So my own argument is that these two processes were completely unrelated, they were separate, but then they occurred simultaneously. So in 2011, after Jonathan became president in very regionally polarizing elections on the platform of a fractured ruling party and with a simmering insurgency about to explode, Boko Haram waged its campaign of violence the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, and the president and his inner circle were busy wrestling, trying to consolidate their, their power within the, the, the ruling party. So consequently, a, a narrative slowly emerged from the president's mostly southern support base that the insurgency was being sponsored by these disgruntled northern politicians to undermine his administration. And this is a view, again, articulated publicly by many of his associates. Uh, you know, uh, people like Chief Edwin Clark or ex-Niger Delta militant uh, Asari Dokubo, who is very, who is, who, 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 is, uh, who is also his associate. You know, they've articulated these views publicly. And it is really a widely shared belief by many, not all, but quite a number of Southerners that the worsening insecurity is evidence of the Northern elite actualizing those threats that they made, as opposed to the governor's challenges bedeviling every aspect of Nigerian society. Uh, you know, and this narrative cites examples of prominent and vocal Northern, northern elite people in uh, the Northern Elders Forum, people like Ango Abdullahi, Junaid Muhammad, advocating fiercely for power to return to the North, or for Jonathan not to run for a second term. I mean, even during my fieldwork, I heard frequently uh, that some of the criticism Jonathan is facing, whether at home or abroad for how, he, has hand, he is handling the insurgency is sponsored by northern elite or northern politicians to discredit him. But then on the other hand, in the north, where most of Boko Haram's attacks and victims are concentrated, there is a widespread sense of fear of alienation and deep distrust pervades. This, the, and this stems from the federal government's inability mm -hmm. to contain the insurgency despite the huge defense funding, um, despite uh, heavy militarization of the Northeast and, and, and things like that. But importantly, again, the president's slow response and perceived indifference to attacks in the North has further alienated him from many Northerners. He only publicly acknowledged the abduction of the Chibok girls two weeks after it had happened. And uh, this was after a great deal of international outcry. You know, you had even legislators in Mexico, in Rome, and so on speaking out. That was when he finally addressed the country and said he would do something about it. And then also, a number of his associates, uh, you know, they have been caught in very questionable circumstances, and there are so many cases, but I'll just give one instance, which is actually very rec recent, it's still ongoing. It's causing a diplomatic spat between Nigeria and South Africa. One of the, the, the president's associates, he, his jets, his private jet was used to launder money to, uh, to, to, to South Africa to procure arms. This is, this is still an ongoing raging controversy. You can look it up on your own. So during my fieldwork, there was a pervasive sentiment in the North, and I'm not saying that this is an accurate assessment or not. This was the sentiment, that the insurgency was deliberately not being contained to prevent elections from taking place in the Northeast which are all opposition states, by the way, the, the, the states that are at the epicenter of the insurgency. So consequently, again, in the North, <coughs> the predominant narrative among many Northerners is that Jonathan's federal government at best has little interest in containing the insurgency, and at worst, some of his associates may be fueling it to weaken the region and its elite's national political leverage. So this blame game, again, is not only regional, it is increasingly partisan. Both the, the ruling PDP, 
and the opposition APC, they have been embroiled in trading accusations and counter accusations uh, on which party is sympathetic to Islamist fundamentalists, which party is financing Boko Haram and all sorts of things. So both parties are actually instrumentalizing the fear around the insurgency to win support and sympathy and also for political mobilization. So I'll quickly conclude now. So the issue here is that while the country's <coughs> elites and citizens are becoming increasingly fragmented and the narratives are becoming more disparate, Boko Haram remains consistent in its vision against Western education, against modern governance structures, and against interreligious harmony. Its tactics are obviously <coughs> rapidly e evolving. So far, it has, in the last three months or so, it has conquered over 26 towns, and not even villages, towns actually in the Northeast. Uh, and one of them, <coughs> some of them have populations reaching up to 250,000 people. They're implementing their vision of Islamic law, the twisted, warped vision of Islamic law. The strong national cohesion needed among Nigeria's leaders and citizens to collectively tackle this terrorist threat is lacking due to contentious local politics. And let me just conclude on this note that really Boko Haram remains a very domestic insurgency located within local political, economic, social, and governance challenges. And Nigeria actually possesses significant and sufficient resources to contain the security challenge. But the thing is, its ability to effectively mobilize and deploy these resources is hampered by the absence of a national consensus on what Boko Haram is, its motivations, and the threats it poses to the country. Thank you.